songwriter, producer, um, and I've been producing and songwriting for about 19 years now. Now, how, how did growing up in Philadelphia kind of shape, you know, who you are now and what you do now and your beliefs and your morals? And well, uh, when I was a kid, um, you know, uh, the, the FOI used to patrol North Philly. Mm -hmm. So if anything ever went wrong, before the police came and fixed it, the FOI, which is a part of the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in the Nation of Islam. Um, we moved to Savannah, Georgia, and kind of moved around Savannah, Georgia, from project to project, until my mom kind of got her footing. Um, after that, when I was about going on my 12th birthday, she asked me what did I want a moped, or if I wanted to move back to Philly. So I said, you know, my destiny is in Philly. I want to move back to Philly. So she packed up the entire house, and she moved back to Philly. And pretty much that, that was it for me. I was a rapper at one time. Mm -hmm. And Philly, I kind of grew up on the streets of Philly. You know, 8th in Indiana. So we kind of like a, became a man, kind of. Right. You know, I was more into a lot of different things that shaped my character. But, you know, well, music has pretty much been a part of my entire life. So as a kid, we used to clean up the house to my mother's music. Mm -hmm. So that was the first fascination with the music. After that, it was more like, you know, she would tell me to go to sleep, and it would be about 11 o'clock at night, and I was supposed to be going to grade school the next morning, but I would be up in the middle of the night with the radio close to my bed, and the volume very low, listening all night long. And I would listen to all of these records, and of course, at that time, they had the slow, quiet jam, slow jam night, so it would be records that had a lot of um, uh, very, very important meaning. Mm -hmm. And you know, just character building. So I kind of fell in love with those lyrical content. And as a kid, all of it like struck to the core of me. Mm -hmm. um, as I grew, that that passion still was with me. So in Savannah, um, our, our cousin named Carl Schumann, we lived in a project called uh, Fred Wessel. And in this project, um, where he would live, like the houses were set up where there were two apartments on the bottom and then two on the top. And the ones on the top had a porch. Mm -hmm. So the porch where Carl lived was right out to the playground. So every day after school, we would go to his house and put up the jukebox. Mm -hmm. And we would be Mars Day in the Time, um, Cool in the Gang, Prince in the Revolution. Mm -hmm. like we, and we would alternate <clears throat> these roles of singing these songs. And, and all of the kids would be out there watching us every day. So that was like the, the mm -hmm. beginning of me getting involved with music and then later on, you know, Soul Sonic Force came out and that was the new fascination and then um, Scorpio, that song Scorpio came out and then that, that triggered another emotion mm -hmm. so I went from trying to be a singer and then once my voice changed and I didn't know how to uh, deal with the changing of the voice, you know what I mean, that puberty kicked in right. so I didn't know how to sing anymore so Rapping was the next best thing, so I started studying rappers, and then, mm. so I started rapping at like around 12, 13 years old. Okay. What got you into rapping, like hip-hop specifically? Um, really, it's just just the message that hip-hop was bringing. Mm. Like, there was there was so many, first of all, I was young. Um, second of all, it was just so many elements that just was cool. Mm. So, every kid wants to be cool, so mm. this was cool, it was new, it was urban. You know what I mean? It was like a black movement. So even though my mother's music, Parliament and Funkadelic mm -hmm. and Marvin Gaye, all of those all of those people were great, but what I gravitated to more was Michael Jackson and Jackson Five, because they looked like me. Right. So when rap came out, it was like, yo, these guys look like mm -hmm. me. So that that's kind of how I got into rap music mm -hmm. and um and that became my passion. Right. What do you think hip hop has lost that it, it had back then? Um Back then, hip hop had a sense of integrity, mm -hmm. it had a sense of respect, it had a sense of honor. Even even in the even in the most gangster record, mm -hmm. it still had a form of integrity, and it had a, a whole lot of truth. Mm -hmm. So um, hip hop now don't have that. Mm -hmm. Hip hop now has a lot of people pretending to be something that they're not. Do you, do you see a certain turning point, a certain milestone where it made that switch? Or, what, or, or, what, or what, at what point you fell out of love? Or, or? Well, um, I can't say I fell out of love because mm -hmm. I still love hip hop. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not gonna ever stop loving hip hop. Right. I love the way it's being treated. I mm -hmm. love the. I hate the way that is. I hate the way that is being 
depicted. I hate the way right. of, I hate the images it's portraying. And, and not that it's portraying it, but to mass media. Right. And not just mass media because everybody thinks nationally, but this is an international look Absolutely. or international appearance of who we are. Absolutely. And those characters, because they are acting characters, don't really exemplify who we are mm -hmm. as a people. So, um, uh, what my me seeing a turning point, I think it was, um, and, and not to blame the South because I love mm -hmm. I love what South hip hop did. It kind of brought a voice to the South, but there's a certain element that came in with it of mm -hmm. uh, ignorance. You know what I mean? And, and a, a, a lack of responsibility, a lack of integrity came in with Southern hip hop. Mm -hmm. So you know, um, yeah. a lot of people, you know, so called blame, put the blame on the South for that. You know, the trap music and, and uh, whatever it may be, but you would I don't think you would say that about Outkast, you know, that that would no. like the, or, or even like Scarface or, no. or Ghetto Boys or anything like that. But then would you say it's closer to like no limit? Was was that ignorant? Um well Ghetto Boys was mm -hmm. Ghetto Boys was ignorant. I remember mm -hmm. when when I was on the corners of Avon, Indiana, Born Killer was the record that got me mm -hmm. started. Like whenever I was when I needed to be amped up, I put on Scarface Born Killer, that's it. I still got it in my iPod now, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it's one of those records that gets you right. gets you pumped and ready for whatever life is gonna bring. Mm -hmm. But um I think, you know, I think the ghetto boys had had, had a touch. I think even Schooly D even from mm -hmm. Philly, he had a touch. Ice T had a touch. So all of it all, all of those elements are are now even in the southern rap. Mm -hmm. But if there was still even with Ice T it was a point of integrity. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like the OG original gangster. Mm -hmm. Like there's a certain hierarchy of respect mm -hmm. that's required if you're going to be if you're singing this song and even colors was like a message. Right. You know what I mean? Schoolie D even though he had PSK and Gucci time, mm -hmm. it was like, you know, he was talking some foul stuff in the record, but then he's also talking about respecting his mama at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Even though the song was disrespectful. Mm -hmm. So um when I think about Southern rap, like No Limit was a little outrageous, mm -hmm. but then again, there was a little integrity. I think, I think the uh, the fat the strip club fascination mm -hmm. is what changed the whole direction of the music. Mm -hmm. I mean, Luke Skywalker did it first right. and got banned, and, and then we it disappeared for a minute. But I think that whole strip club mentality, the woman who everybody searched for the stripper to be their wife. Everybody's looking to make sure their record is banging in the strip club. Everybody's fascinated with Magic City and all the other strip clubs. So once strip club became the new fascination, the music began to take the turn for the worse. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I want to play the devil's advocate, but you're right. Like It's, it's kind of hard arguing for hip-hop that has that type of message and stuff. And um, what, at what point did you decide you, know, you had to do something and, and you know, be the be the voice for this rage against the ratchet movement. Well, you know, there, there's a couple parts that happen, and it's, it's crazy. Uh, one Sunday morning, I was getting well. Let's start here. Two years ago, I went to a concert on South Street. Mm -hmm. When I got to the concert, there was um, it was a lot of indie artists, a lot of new young up and coming artists. So there were kids in there from age eight to about 21, and then there was adults from about 21 to 35, whatever. But they were all in the crowd. Mm -hmm. So every artist that came on the stage, it was like, BF that, suck my D. And I'm like, yo, these little kids is in the crowd. Like, mm -hmm. yo, this is crazy. Then the next group come up, they bring two strippers on stage. So the strippers is in their thongs and they shaking it. So the little kids out there, like, <laughs> they, they recording it on their on phone. But you know, what you expect. But you know, it's just like, yo. Nobody has no respect for these kids that are in the audience. Like you're not even screening the artists coming to the stage knowing that you got kids from 8 to 21. Okay, of course about 15, 16, they may have already experienced life. But everything from 15 on down is going to be totally corrupted mm -hmm. from this show. So I left there like, man, this, this is some nonsense. Like there was not one good lyric, not one good song. Matter of fact, there was one artist with good lyrics and nobody listened to them. Mm. They were all talking. Everything else was 808, mm. 
<laughs> snare, the, the 808 kick. Stand you couldn't right. even understand them all you were with mother F a boo, suck my beat. It was like, yo, these bees up in here. Ho. I'm like, yo, the, the women around here, they in there bouncing like, yo, do you realize that he's talking about y'all? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, y'all celebrate these, right. you know, y'all who he talking about, right? So, you know, that was the first phase. And then one Sunday morning, I was getting up for church. And a uh, voice guy was like, yo, I need you to rage against radio because mm -hmm. that's not cool. Soon after that, I was working with someone. Um, I was helping, uh, I used the camera from time to time. So I was doing photography for the first lady of our church. And um, so I'm just, for Mother's Day, so I'm just shooting the you know, mothers and Beyonce partition comes on the radio. Mm -hmm. And there's a little girl, she had to be no older than four years old, no younger than four, no older than six. Mm -hmm. She's singing Partition, every single lyric, mm -hmm. and doing her best sachet of sexiness that she could do. And I'm like, yo, whose child is this? So the mother is in the chair, she's like, oh, that's my daughter. Yo, I'm like, yo, like, are you cool with that? She's like, no, I don't even know where she heard the song from. Mm -hmm. I don't even play the radio. Like, I don't know where she got this from. But the girl knew the song word for word. And I'm like, yo, this, that song is... Mm. Y'all say on her knees, he Monica Lewinsky on my blouse. Like, yo, like that little kid should not be singing that. Mm. Plus, the record gets nasty as it goes. Right. So it's like, in my eyes, I'm like, okay, so we got a four to six year old stripper in the train. You know what I'm saying? What else is she going to want to be? Like, if Beyonce is it, right. then that's what she's going to grow up to be eventually. Why do you go after the radio as to more, more so than the parents in that situation? Well, so I did a study, I found some things out, did some research. Uh, 40 years ago, a working parent spends 15 minutes with their child. Mm. That was on the average, 15 minutes on the average. Now, 40 years later, now 2014, a working parent spends an hour with their child. Mm. So if you do the math from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., that's 14 hours. Mm. Out of 14 hours, there's only 13 hours that the parent can actually, there's only one hour out of that that the parent is involved with. So there's 13 open hours for the child to be influenced by radio, TV, and, and friends. Mm -hmm. So the pressure to be cool surpasses parental power. I don't care what anybody think. Music is our culture. In order to be cool, you have to know the music. Mm -hmm. So a child is, has to be up on top of every song because every song talk about the fashion it talks it gives us the new lingo it gives us everything so most of the kids are being informed through the music i went after radio because when you look at radio radio is the gatekeeper radio is the new drug dealer mm -hmm. but the difference between radio and the drug dealer the drug dealer charge you for the drug mm -hmm. radio is free you can tune on that at anywhere at any time free listening and getting audio porno plus gun clapping, drug abuse, rape, murder, all, everything is in it. So all of those things are the, are, are the reason why I'm going after radio. The other reason why I'm going after radio, you and I right now, we can think of about four commercials and their jingles. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we go to Big Red, you can kiss a little longer. Mm -hmm. If you go to Devilman Twins, if we go to the Coca-Cola commercial, Oscar Mayer commercial, we can even go to the, uh, the Auto Loan commercial. Mm -hmm. And we'll sing that song, not even know why we're singing the jingle. Because once it's played into your subconscious, it never leaves. So the marketing, uh, marketing companies make billions and billions of dollars. Most companies spend billions of dollars in marketing. One of the number one marketing tools they use is music. Because once it play in, it don't play out. Mm -hmm. So you find yourself buying Tide. It's not because you like it. It's because that, that you've been programmed to like it. So when I think about the music programmers of the radio station, they're not programming the station, they're programming the people. Now you and I both right now, we can literally say, you can think of every song that you hate and you may know the whole hook of that song. Mm -hmm. That's deep. Because the food that you hate, you don't, even, you don't even taste it again or try to taste it again. If you went somewhere and you didn't like it, you probably forgot what it looked like and you're never going back again. But the songs that you hate, you remember every lyric. It don't play out of your system. So I think radio has a way of programming people to automatically believe that they like something that they don't like. 
You know what I mean? Because I'm singing Jump Up On My Bed, Put My Swag On. Hate that song. Hate it. Everything about it is disgusting. But I know it. Why? Because I heard it. Not even a million times. Two times on the radio. I know the dumb song. You know what I mean? So it, I, I, I'm after radio because they have to find a better way of programming. Radio was responsible back in the day. It was the voice of our community. It was actually the, the tool that built our community. It informed us of what was going on. It informed us of how we can get over it. Now radio is the poison to our community. So that's what I'm going after. And is it, it, do you think it actually is productive to go after these stations? Because their agenda is to um, you know make money at the end of the day. They want to have these commercials listened to and they want to get this check from the label. Um, what about your movement will be productive in actually getting these radio stations to listen? And, and well, uh, that's a good question. And, and um, trying to get them to listen, some may listen, some may not. When I went to Power 99, they basically was like, it's not our fault, we're not doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Even though they are doing something wrong there, they're actually breaking the FCC regulations. So, you know, I have something in the works on that. Okay, how, so, how so? Because they're not supposed to play any music that's sexually, with sexually content, mm -hmm. or that's prudent, or uh, um, that's talking about excretions, or any of that nature. They're not supposed to play that from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's on the radio all day long. Mm -hmm. So, it's, it's, a, it's a direct um, violation of the uh, FCC regulations. Mm -hmm. So, that, that's the first part. They're not going to listen to the argument. But the protest is, is bigger than the radio station listening. It's more about the community and bringing the community together because this is a building of a community. And not just a white community or a black community, but an American community. And the whole idea of it is that once we start to communicate and we have unity, then that's where community comes from. Communication and unity. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get us to have a conversation about what we're actually allowing to be said and to be passed like it's not an issue when it's really an issue. Right. Not to mention, every radio host, every radio disc jockey, every PD is 40 plus, 35, 40 plus. So you're really a grown up. Like you are, you are an adult or a parent saying it's okay to poison our kids. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, really at what point do you decide to grow up? Right. You, you yeah. understand it's a business, you understand that they make money, but you just want them to have a sense of the accountability. Right, accountability. I, I need them to be more responsible on top of that. Just give balance. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's okay if you if, if you gonna play that, put it between 10 a 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. and then also give us balance. Like it, it, there's supposed to be a yin and a yang. Right now we getting yinned up. Mm -hmm. Ain't no yang. You know what I'm saying? So the whole mission right now is like yo, at least bring balance to what's happening. At least bring us some type of balance, and yeah. that's what we're looking for. So you're not asking for a complete revamp. You know that's unreasonable. You you just want to expect some balance because you know there is. You know, absolutely ignorance in our culture and stuff, and that can be represented. But you have to represent the good side too. Man. Right, exactly. It's like you're giving us, you're giving the world one view <clears throat> of a community that, that's not true. And what's really crazy is, so the Fourth of July, they did the uh, the thing on the Parkway, mm -hmm. they had Nicki Minaj up there, and lyrically outrageous. Mm -hmm. Like, if if you, if you want to, um, this is the way you better your business, in my mind. So if I need listenership or viewership and I need more viewership and there's an issue that we're not getting the viewership that we need, if you're, if you're geared to one audience, then you're, you're only going to have a limited amount of viewership. But if, you're, if your radio station is family friendly, then that means you're going to get the mother, the father, and the children. That's, that, you're dealing with three uh, categories of three age groups, but you're gonna you're gonna get three uh, three separate audience. So you get the mother and the father, and then the children. Which each parent may have five to ten children. But if the parent can okay the music, then you'll get more listenership. And then of course, then you can get your money instead of from the record labels. You can get it from advertisers for real. We well, research and we find out you're a Grammy, you know, winning artist, and that's a that's a huge look. And uh, Philadelphia took home the first you know hip hop Grammy ever. Yeah. And um, how do you think that, you know, the, in the larger scale, the bigger umbrella of the entire music industry, you know, we gave, they gave hip hop a chance with that first Grammy. And then um, how do you think they look at it now? Do you think they like kind of regret giving the Grammys? Because now they're giving it to artists like Macklemore who, who are kind of taking a different turn. And right. Well, think about this. When you think about the Grammys, 
you think prestigious, Absolutely. you think respectful, you think honorable. Like this is like the one of the greatest awards and this is televised worldwide. So if you look at last year, right, there was, there was no Miley Cyrus, there was no Justin Bieber, <laughs> there was no Rick Ross. Like they took, there was no Nicki Minaj, they took anything that could remotely ruin the reputation of the Grammys and dead it. It wasn't even aired. They made sure they didn't air it. Now, when, when, you, when you look at what they're doing, even with the categories, they're scaling the categories down to push certain things out. So, you know, even though they have given hip hop the opportunity and Macklemore won, I understand why. He has family friendly music. Nobody's going to listen to a Macklemore album like, yo, this is terrible. Oh, no, I feel disrespected. Like, nobody's going to say that. Because he's saying all of the right things. He's speaking to the, the gay community. He's speaking to the white community. He's speaking to the poor. He's speaking to the rich. Like he, he's the voice to every community. So, yeah, why, why wouldn't you get a, a world-renowned Grammy for a world-renowned message? You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I respect that. Kendrick Lamar was there. And again, he's another hip-hop artist with some integrity. So they gave him a platform. But... They, if you if you look, they took away everything. So the Grammy is now recognizing that that mm -hmm. they can't have that look. It's not a good look for them. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. So ethical music entertainment is a, a record label that I started, but it's kind of bigger than that. It's, it's a record label. It's a, a, a television produced production company. It's a, a concert production company, and basically all we do is we create family friendly events. Mm -hmm. We have an artist by the name of Bria Marie, who was a family-friendly artist. We call her the Fresh Princess, and, and her mission is to bring back respect to women. So when you hear her music, it's always on like a demand for respect for herself, and then teaching other girls like, yo, why, why are you falling for that? Like, you better than that. So it's kind of like an uplifting thing for young women, but um, and that's what we do. That's what this company is about. We we going into the schools, we do an anti-bullying campaign for kids that are dealing with issues. Um, we're building a school in uh, um, Chester, not Chester, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, in Harrisburg. We're building a school in Harrisburg. The, I have a program that I'm going into school in Chester to teach the kids how to write and produce good music, quality music. So ethical music entertainment is this entity that's uh, pushing forth a new genre of music, which is ethical music. I wanted to know, like, what um, what type of feedback have you gotten? I know you've got a lot of positive feedback from Rage Against the Ratchet, but I also know that you, like some of your friends, are, you know, work for the radio stations and things. So what has that conversation been like, knowing what it is that you're doing? And they're like, but this is what I do for a living. Like, has that been negative, positive? Talk about that. Well, well um, yeah, I mean, of course, I, I'm expecting a negative result as far as money is concerned, because radio is the best way a writer gets paid. Um, some of my friends in radio are trying to figure out, yo, what are you doing? And then some of them in radio already know, like, the music is terrible. So, <laughs> they, you, it, it's hard to build, it's hard to argue with something that you know is true. You know what I mean? But, you know, of course you get those, you get those, uh, those Stevens and Jangos. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, there's there's quite a few Stevens that has jumped out of the box like, yo, why are you attacking us? Why are you just like, dude, I'm not attacking you. I'm attacking that industry that's behind you. Mm -hmm. and, and that industry behind you needs to be responsible for our community. And for you jumping up, the community has supported you because of who you are. So recognize we need to support our community. The machine is only going to continue to be a machine as long as it's feeding the community. So if we don't accept it anymore. Right. Yeah, I agree. Right. So, you know, so I, I got a little bit of kickback, but that's what I'm doing it for. I want I want I want that kickback. I actually want that conversation. I want to sit down. I want to have that debate so they can actually search within themselves cuz I I'm only reasoning with your own intellect. I'm not this isn't my mission. This isn't like carving and saying this is something that God has put me on and I'm I'm doing it. So, all I can do is reason with your intellect and say you tell me, do you think it's good? Do you do you think it has morals? <laughs> and then we go from there. Would you say that you've kind of, in, in a roundabout way, always been on this path, though? Because I know since I've known you, all of your music has been music I could play with my mom, my niece, when she yeah. was little, my grandmother. Like, all the music I know that you put your hand in is yeah. positive. Like, yeah. you don't have, 
and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you don't have songs that are cursing women out no. and, mm -hmm. and telling people, you know, yeah, go no. shoot yourself or whatever. Yeah, absolutely correct. Like one of my one of my goals in creating uh, was I'm never doing anything derogatory. Even when I was a rapper, I was like, I'm not rapping about drug dealers. I was a drug dealer. That, that's not a good life. Like it's it's nothing to glorify. Like it's paranoia. You think somebody gonna kill you? You worried about going to, like there's nothing glorif There's nothing to glorify. I'm stressed out. I can barely sleep. Like, what is that? Why, why do I want to brag about that? So, you know, even as a rapper, it was never my mission to do that. So once I started writing R&B, it's like, why would I write something that can destroy people when I can easily create good records that make people feel good? Like, that's what music did for me. It made me feel good. Like, it had some type of feeling and some type of emotion that when it played, it was like, man, it make you feel good. And if you was feeling down, you can play a record. If you wanted to feel down, you put on this record, and that record will make you as sad as you wanted to feel. You could cry your eyes out, and then you could put on happy feeling, and you'd be feeling happy again. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, that, that's been my mission, to always create music that make you feel, that touch your emotions, that move you in a certain way that, that start to actually jar your memories and, and make you, like, um, one of my goals was like to create music that, that could be bookmarkers in people's lives. So it's like every time you hear that song, it'll take you back to the first time you kissed your girlfriend. Or every time you hear that song, it'll take you right back to that moment where you first heard the song and, and what you felt then. So it'll always be a bookmarker to your life. So, you know, um, yeah, that's, that's been my ultimate goal and still is. And that's what we're still creating. Um. I mean, on the radio, do you feel like there is any type of balance? Because they, we do still have artists like Kendrick Lamar and, and uh, you know, Jay Coles and Drake's who add, you know, their their own, you know, side of things who aren't absolutely on that, you know, you know, wake up, your swag on and all that. So do you yeah. think there is a certain type of balance with those type of artists? Or? Well, I, I, think, I think with every artist that you've named, they have records that are good records. Mm -hmm. But the records that's on the on the radio is I wish I could f every girl in the world. Mm. You know what I mean? Where J Cole got a song that's talking about being beautiful or crooked smile, but they rather play the song where he's talking about all these hoes and bees and all that. So it's like, give us those records. Mm. Give us give us the the cool J Cole. Don't give us J Cole that's, that's disrespecting every woman. So it's like you have those artists with good music, but you choose not to play the good music. So um, there is a balance. I mean, there's, there's no balance, but you got to think. Happy came out with Pharrell. That's the number one song in, in the country on every format that's being used for everything from uh, Good Morning America down to Fiat. You know what I'm saying? And everybody's singing it because everybody really ultimately wants to be happy. But then right after that, they come back with a record, move that dope. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, and now... That's climbing to be the number one record. So, you know, it's like, it's hard to say, it's hard to say I love you, but I'm going to smack you in the face at the same time. So it's like, you got these contradictory messages happening, coming from this one artist. It's like, so I, I can lure you in to make you think it's good, but it's really not that good. Mm -hmm. Here, here's what's funny. Um, if your whole life you've eaten hot dogs, then you would think hot dogs were the greatest thing since sliced bread. But until somebody introduced you to steak, then you'll go, oh, wow, I didn't know there was an option. So right now, the kids only like what they like because that's all they're getting. But the truth of the matter is, if you ask any one of those thugs, little kids, whatever you want to call them, to sing happy, they're all, they'll sing the song from top to bottom and be happy while they're singing it. Because that's the only option they had outside of the nonsense. And what's crazy, I did a, um, took my camera out and I interviewed like maybe about 30 kids. And I asked them about what they feel about radio. And I was like, well, you know, I don't feel nothing in radio. You know, they kind of play the same five songs over and over again. I don't really like it, but I just listen to it. And I said, well, would you play, this, play radio with your mom and your grandma in the car? Every last one of them, no, man, it's disrespectful, man. No, I would never do that. So our, they already know that it's bad. The thing is, is they don't have an option. So radio will present something and the kids will accept it. And then you got to remember, if I'm a kid and I think radio is governed by adults and adults are saying that this is cool, then it's all right for me to do it because it's already been sanctioned by the adults and been reviewed by the adults that this is okay to listen to. 
You know what I mean? It's like we keep forgetting that they're children. I don't care how thuggish they want to be or what type of gun, they're still children. And they just need leadership. So I think at this point, this is where Rage Against the Ratchets come in. It's like, yo, we got to stand up and be leaders and stop following these kids who don't have a clue. You know what I mean? So Right, right. It's kind of like, a, I don't know if you've seen the movie, it's kind of like Monsters, Inc. It's like they harness energy through kids screaming in their fear. Right. They, they got like a ten times more energy when they get them to laugh. Right, absolutely. <laughs> but they didn't know that because they never tried that. Right, they never tried it, absolutely. Like, so it's been exactly a month since you did the protest uh, at Power 99, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, have you seen any like physical changes that anyone's ever made like from any of the other radio stations? You know what's funny? I've, I've actually heard kind of a change from uh, 103 to B. Uh, I've noticed a slight change even in the conversations that the disc jockeys are having now. It's kind of lightened up a little bit. I don't, you know, I can't say that's a tribute to the, the actual march. Power 99 has not changed a bit. So, again, I'm excited about that because, you know, David and Goliath, that's the giant that I, I can't wait to walk out with my slingshot with. So, yeah. I'm excited about this whole mission. You know, we gave them a warning. So now we, you know, we move by force next time. So, yeah. Cool. What do you think it is about music that connects us all globally? Like whether it's, you know, crossing cultures, uh, just across the world, and you've traveled, so you know, like yeah. how when you go to different places, the music is different? Yeah. What is it? You know, um, honestly, I believe like music is a spiritual thing and, and it goes beyond your ears. Like it goes beyond the ears. It goes right to the soul of a person. And I think it, I, and I can't really explain the feeling, but I remember being six years old and hearing me and Mrs. Jones. And I knew that record was bad, but I understood the emotion that was behind it. It was like the conviction in the voice and everything he was saying, he did not feel good about sleeping with somebody else's wife. He did, it wasn't a good feeling for him and I could feel it. And it was, I could feel that pain in his voice as he sang the song. So I think music resonates with the soul of a person. 